proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism, and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magus, the more, the better. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another reading of Code Word Barbalon 666, Danger in the Vatican. Today is February 25th. I almost said 26th. <laughs> Jumping ahead a day. Uh, yeah, today we are on chapter 21, Number and Influence of the Jesuits, and I'm joined here with Yerk Lisman. Yerk? Yes? How are you doing, man? Hello, Brett. I'm quite fine, and uh, opposite to you, I'm already awake a few hours. Great. Um, That's fantastic. You're ready to go, 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 yeah. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm already sitting half an hour here on the computer waiting for you because I told you that I would be earlier, but uh, then, of course, for you, it was a sign to sleep in. No mm. problem. <laughs> yeah. No problem. You have uh, you have done a lot of work also, and I understand that you need your rest. Yes. And uh, we have been well, quite busy yesterday you know, with the reading and the, the Bible point, study. Yerk, uh, we just got about another eight inches of snow here and i was out shoveling and yeah i just get wiped you know uh i i don't know i i guess i like using the shovel i do have a snow blower i could mm -hmm. get it up and running and and use that but oh maybe i should later today i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's a little easier so you're already a little bit longer awake than this 10 minutes that you are on the computer oh, you already yeah, yeah, went yeah. out shoveling snow no, I wasn't well, that's out good. this morning yet, but uh, no, actually oh. last night, yes. So oh, yeah. okay. the point is I worked out pretty good last night and I, because, I crashed pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I thought if you were shoveling snow this morning already, yeah. then your blood circulation would have been uh, very well and Better. you would be wonderfully <laughs> awake yeah. right now. Yeah, that's true. Instead of probably falling asleep. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm just kidding. You're not yeah, falling yeah, asleep. Yeah, 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 I know. Oh, yeah. I understand. And and listen, I'm I'm quite glad that we have this arrangement that for mm -hmm. me in the afternoon and for you in the morning, we can even come together and do these readings. I mean, um, I, I think the people are hungry for this knowledge. At least I hope yeah, so. I pray so. I would so. think so, too. At least the few that are awake. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe here and there we're going to awake somebody who has not been awoke, awoken yet. Yeah. Because, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Usually what happens is they get really angry with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, when this video, uh, someone sometimes gets an intriguing title uh, that is even sometimes for people who are not interested in the subject to have a look at it. And maybe when they just um, come in into the, and, and at the right moment and hear the right words, right words spoken or read, they say, mm -hmm. oh, this is maybe interesting and they're going to follow the whole thing and by that they maybe come to a path that they have not walked on before that's right I mean, uh, oh yeah 
Yeah. God works in mysterious ways, we can only say, because we don't understand the ways of God. <laughs> no, we don't. We, <laughs> we don't. would be very presumptuous if we, if, we, if, we, if we told we did. That's right. Well, you know, but, this um, is true. I mean, there's a lot of wolves in this world in all corners of life. And, uh, you know, these wolves have a way of, of controlling the sheep. And um, Yeah, you know, the wolves are not the problem, Brett. No, the, they're not. The wolves right. in sheep clothing are the problem. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the wolves in sheep's clothing. That's right. But still, the wolf, you know, the wolf is not a problem. That one you, you you see and you keep away from. But this is true. This is true. But you know, there's a there's. It seems like I don't know. To me, there's all kinds of different secular activity going on, and uh, you know, when you're entangled up in that, and uh, you're you're claiming Christ as your savior, but you don't even know. You know the history behind the Bible and all that. You know it's it's really an entangled mess we're in. You know, and, mm. and then to come to this shocking realization of uh, the papacy being the antichrist of our heritage is as Bible believers throughout the ages. You know that's really something, and the Inquisitions and all that. So yeah, I mean it's uh, it'd be really wonderful if we could bring more people into this realm, but it's just it just seems really tough. It is really tough. So yeah. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna begin reading in the book on page two hundred and ten. That is where we left off. Last time, we have to start a new chapter, chapter 21, called Number and Influence of the Jesuits. And I just want to remind you, Brett, that you keep an eye on the footnotes, and I will keep an eye on the text. Okay? Mm -hmm. Number and Influence of the Jesuits. The Jesuits here, there, and everywhere. Populem late regem. A people ruling far and wide. That's from the Ainit. And you know that one. Mm. as one of the foundational writings from Virgil of the Roman pagan nation. Mm -hmm. And it starts off with another interesting quote from Jesuit general Petro Arupo and Hans-Peter Kolvenbach. Both generals made these um, quote, with more branch offices than Coca-Cola, unquote. Were Ignatius Loyola to return to live today, and uh, sorry, to return to life today, and would be as pleased. What is that word I'm reading here? Someday I'm going to learn how to read. I'm sorry. Sure, that's okay. Were Ignatius Loyola to return to life today, he would be as pleased as Punch. And this is a saying that we can read in the footnote that is going back to Thomas Moore. And yes. we all of know, of course, know Thomas Moore, yes. because he had the um, the quarrel in the time with the King of England in the what, what was it, 12th century or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and this is, oh no, this is from Thomas Moore's Letters of 1813. So that must be another another Thomas Moore. I only know that one who had the dispensation with the King of England at that time. Um, to Lady Donegal. I was, as the poet said, as pleased as Punch. This oh, is the earliest is record of this phrase. Okay. Yeah, that's a different Thomas Moore then. Anyway, um, were Ignatius Loyola to return to life today, he would be pleased as Punch and proud of what he founded, of, we, of what he found. His order still thriving and more powerful than ever. The great Jesuit enterprise, setbacks and suppressions, notwithstanding, has been a spectacular success. Their training would not have changed very much. Their strategies, although refined, still the same. The greater glory of God, or ad maiorem die gloriam, would still be their motto, and their grand design would be unchanged. Their progress over all of Europe, Asia, Africa, England, and the quote-unquote new world of the Americas would be to Ignatius as jewels upon his saintly crown. His militia of priests has done enough to pay for all the souls in purgatory. Their achievements, attainments, and victories 
are immeasurably beyond our abilities to quantify. Without them, Romanism would have long collapsed. Today, and this is about the year 2006 when the book was published, the Jesuits, as always, are very busy. In October 2000, the then Jesuit general, Peter Hans Kolvenbach, who was Jesuit general until 2008, told his order, quote, The turn of the millennium finds the Jesuits in all their diversity. They are larger, better equipped, more complex and professional than ever before, and also more concerned about their Catholic Jesuit identity. Our students are involved in every sort of social action, tutoring dropouts, demonstrating in Seattle, serving in soup kitchens, promoting pro-life, protesting against the school of the Americas, and we are proud of them for it. As a Jesuit, it is essential to go beyond them and find ways of attracting, hiring, and promoting those who actively share the mission." Unquote. The Jesuits call their headquarters in each country provinces, an indication that the order considers itself a separate government from the state or country in which it operates. Shadow government, some say also. For example, the California province of the Society of Jesus. How many Jesuits are there today? As long ago as 1761, we are told by M. de la Chalotte, in a footnote to his report, quote, there are nearly 20,000 Jesuits in the world, all imbued with ultramontane doctrines and the doctrine of murder, unquote. That was well over two centuries ago. On July 21st, 1773, when Pope Clement XIV issued his famous bull Dominus Acredemptor Nostrat, he counted 22,000 members. In the formidable Jesuit book, Jesuits, a multi-biography, Jean Le Coutre, tells us that in 1965, after his election by, quote, the Jesuit congregation, the Black Council, the Jesuit superior general, Pedro Arube, decided to send a questionnaire to the 33,000 Jesuits, then registered throughout the world. And it is claimed, according to one Jesuit source, that they numbered approximately 20,408 at the start of the 21st century. But my readers will not attach a high degree of accuracy to any of these quote-unquote official Jesuit statements. In fact, there are those like author Peter MacDonnell, a political science professor and Bian at Bianchi, a political science professor and Bianchi, a professor emeritus of religion at the Jesuit-run Emory University, who would have us believe that the number of Jesuits have sharply dwindled to as little as 3,635 in the year 2000. This assertion by these two Jesuit professors demonstrate most clearly the disingenuous distortions that we have come to expect from Jesuit scholars. How could there be as little as 3,635 Jesuits in 2000 when Jesuit General Kolvenbach told his order in October of that same year, quote, the turn of the millennium finds them, the Jesuits, larger better equipped and point, point, point than before, unquote. How could they be larger and better equipped if their numbers had fallen to less than 4,000 members worldwide? The Catholic Encyclopedia of 2003 states, quote, there was no loss of, num uh, there was no loss of numbers, but on the contrary, a steadily growth. From 1,000 members in 12 provinces in 1656, it had grown to 13,112 in 27 provinces in 1615, to 17,665 in 1680, with 88 seminaries, 578 colleges, 160 residences, and 106 foreign missions. And in spite of every obstacle, persecution, expulsion, in 1749, 
it numbered 22,589 members, of whom only, only 11,293 were priests in 41 provinces, with 176 seminaries, 669 colleges, and 273 foreign missions. Unquote. Again, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the number of Jesuit writers exceeds 120,000. How could there be over 120,000 Jesuit writers since the founding of the order in 1540, but less than 3,635 Jesuits in 2000? Try again, Professors McDonough and Bianchi. Even if we add it up, which would be incorrect, all the figures for each year above, 1656 to 2000, we will not get 120,000 Jesuits. As such, for there are to have been 120,000 Jesuit writers, the total membership of the order since 1540 must have been well in excess of that number and is probably still the case today. Now, before we we go even further further into this reading and throwing around with numbers. I'm going to tell you one thing. The Roman Catholic Church resides at the Vatican in Rome. The Vatican in Rome is the smallest kingdom in the earth, but it is, on the other hand, the most powerful. The Roman Catholic Church asserts itself as being poor, they have no money. In Germany for the moment, in Hamburg, is a big discussion since a few weeks because the Roman Catholic Church will close down eight different schools. I applaud it, but in Germany, almost a war breaks out, and they don't understand why the Catholics are clothing their school, closing their schools. I don't care. The point that I want to make is, the Roman Catholic Church is the richest institution in the world, and the small Vatican country, the smallest country in the world, has all other countries in their submission. Do you really believe that the Jesuits are a few thousand in numbers? I mean, they are lying through their teeth when they open their mouth. Yeah. Of course they are much bigger than that, and it doesn't matter how big they are. I tell you one thing, even one Jesuit to me as a Bible-believing Christian is one Jesuit too much. Yeah, I agree. I don't care about all these numbers uh, throwing around here. You know, there was Voltaire who said that in the 17th century, there were more than 6,000 books you could read about the Jesuit order. Look at how many books that we have today on that. I mean, you can barely get to probably 10% of that. I, I think not even 10% because that would be 600 books on the Jesuits. I don't think that you have that many. Yeah, That was in the 17th century. And then the yeah. question was, uh, was, was asked, was asked, why are there always coming out new books about the Jesuits? Well, that's a very easy answer. You have a progression in, within the Jesuit order, and you have always more and new Jesuits. And, of course, you have also more and new people who are being busy with the subject of the Jesuits, studying that, studying the Roman Catholic Church, studying the synagogue of Satan, studying the society of Jesus. And as long as there will be people added to both, counts to both uh, uh, how do you say to both camps mm -hmm. there will be new books about the Jesuits and there will be new readers about the Jesuits because the most of the readers of today who read about Jesuits today they don't want to read a book from the 16th or 17th century they reject that for the same reason they reject the King James Bible oh well, well, that's English from 1611 that's oh dude I don't want to do that yeah that's it mm -hmm. yeah they right. want to have contemporary writings, but there are not so many contemporary writings on the Jesuit order, and the old books you can't get anymore. If today you can gather 600 books worldwide, different books, I don't mean 20 of that and 20 of that, I mean different books, different editions, different writers, different books, 600 different writings on the Jesuits, if you can gather that today, I guess you can count yourself very, very lucky. I don't think you have even that much. And Voltaire said at that time there were more than 6,000. Mm. That's how the Jesuits have been successful in suppressing that stuff. And you're going to tell me that there are only a few thousands in number? 
BS. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely BS. That's I right. mean, you have to count everyone. You have to count everyone from the um, and then just coed- think. Just oh, from and think the, of all the people yeah, from, that from are the just coed- deceived by the Jesuits. Yeah, okay, that's that's a greater number, even. <laughs> Oof, man, yeah, it's should, very, shouldn't very even great. start going there. But the the problem but, you know, you is have to... the way I understand it, the way I comprehend what, how Jesuitism works is, you know, you, all you have to do is just be ignorant, and you you fall right into that trap. You can just play right along with the Jesuits, and oh, they're fine, they're good people. It's yeah, I know, it's pretty subtle, I, but I, I agree, I agree. It's it's. It's, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. Well. It's it's just yeah. such a huge problem that it, it it's so hard to, to. There was a famous person, Brett, who once mm. said, um, "For for for evil to succeed, yeah. uh, all it needs is the good men to do nothing." To do nothing. That's right. Or to say and nothing. And to do yeah. nothing and to do nothing is another ex- expression for being ignorant. Absolutely. So. When, when the people today are being ignorant, it is no wonder that evil rules. Yeah, I think there's a quote from the, the dedication I read to the the book uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnickley, that ignorance is the, uh, ah, ignorance paves the way to the triumph of Rome. I think that's the quote. Ignorance paves the way Rome, to the triumph Rome, of Rome. Rome feeds on the ignorance of the people, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So if we can promote ignorance, all right, we got it made. See, that's how mm-hmm. it works. Keep them stupid, bread and circuses. Yeah. That's all we get. Keep them ignorant of what's going on. Yeah, right. Yeah. They should take care of everything, but not take care of real politics and religion. Oh, yeah, just... Be as perverted as possible. Yeah, that's how it is these days. It's sick. So, my point is just, when you know that the Vatican, which is the smallest kingdom in the world, controls all the kings of the earth, because I I believe the Bible to be true, and Revelation 17 tells us exactly that, Mm -hmm. and the Roman Catholic Church, everywhere she goes and stands, we don't have any money. (laughs) <laughs> it's the richest institution in all the world then of course when here quote unquote Jesuits or Jesuit professors or whatever professors McDonald and Bianchi even come out with this ridiculous number of less than 4,000 Jesuits don't believe it don't believe it I mean how would that be possible you have to take into account every Jesuit coadjutor Mm-hmm. You have to take into account every scholastic and every professed. Now, the professed are small in number. I give you that. But the coadjutors are massive in number because you have two kinds of coadjutors. Oh, you have, yes. have the spiritual coadjutors and you have the temporal coadjutors. And the temporal coadjutors are sitting everywhere. Yeah, they are. They are sitting in companies. They are sitting in politics. They are sitting everywhere in our society. Yep. And, and this then, is just ridiculous of speaking of a few. Of and then few you add all the, sub, the subordinates to that system. Ah, oh, It's just in, staggering, incredible. The deception here going on is just, it's <clears throat> just, you know, uh, it, it will reach a tipping point. And I believe at that tipping point is when we're going to see persecutions like no tomorrow, man. Yep. When the people finally start waking up and seeing it as plain as day, that's when we're going to see Christians, real Bible believers, being taken care of. Well, listen, this chapter is called Number and Influence of the Jesuits. I hope that we are done with the numbers and we can go all over to the order of the influence of the Jesuits because that is much more important. The influence that they have is much more important than the numbers they are having. But I'm going to continue now in the middle of page 2 or 12. But please take into consideration what I just commented on. I do not believe for a second these ridiculous numbers. But it is like the Jesuit order makes itself in the world as a fine, quote-unquote, nice and godly and 
and and and and and uh, righteous true or and righteous organization thank yes. you yes uh, which they are not that they are playing these numbers around i mean what would you say if the general of the society of jesus stands there and tell you i'm gonna tell you we have one million three hundred and eighty nine thousand jesuits in the world <laughs> uh! yeah yeah and even that number might have been not correct but even could be surpassed by the reality a jesuit never tells the truth D don't you get it Yeah, that's they just... never tell the truth. They are imputed with lies. The truth is, the author continues, that the real number of these double agents, this ready army of the Pope, has been deliberately played down by the order for obvious reasons. <laughs> Even... <laughs> I haven't read that before. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you. P.D. Stewart. Even Jesuit General Hans-Peter Kovenbach, who ruled between 1983 and 2008 as General of the Society, I told you mm -hmm. before, it was 2008, then it was Adolfo Nicolas who took over, okay. admitted in the year 2000 that their numbers include, quote, priests and brothers spread out in almost every country of the world with more branch offices, said Pedro Arube, Than Coca Cola. Pedro Arupe was the 28th Superior General of the Jesuits from 1965, from 1965 to 1983. Hmm. And while they appear to be, quote, declining in numbers markedly in Europe and North America, unquote, said General Kolvenbach, quote, they are growing in India, Africa, Latin America, and the Far East. Uh, China, anyone? Japan, anyone? Thailand, anyone? India, anyone? Mm -hmm. To quote Father Peter Hans Kolvenbach again, the turn of the millennium finds them in all that diversity. They are larger, better equipped, more complex and professional than ever before. So it seems that even if, as is alleged, the Jesuits have been decreasing rapidly in number, we have good reason to regard such figures as are given as too conservative. For example, from an article by Louis Lambert in the, Gaul uh, in the Gaulois, August of 18, 1886, we are told that, quote, in 1750, there were 40,000 Jesuits all over the world. Yet, he says that in 1800, so that's 50 years later, Officially, there were about 1,000 men only. <laughs> In 1886, they numbered between 7 and 8,000. Amazing, amazing! According to the above official report between 1750 and 1800, the Jesuits lost 30,000 members. Lies, damn lies and statistics, as Disraeli said so memorably. As Dr. James Edgar Wiley eloquently observed, quote, there is no disguise which the Jesuit will not wear, no art he will not employ, no motive he will not feign, no creed he will not profess, provided only he can acquit himself a true soldier in the Jesuit army and accomplish the work on which he has been sent forth, unquote. Dr. Mackenzie declares, quote, their spies are everywhere of all apparent ranks and uh, of society, unquote. And we have it on good authority that the Jesuits have been active in forming other holy orders or sodalities, such as the Knights of Peter Claver and the Knights of Columbus, over which they retain immense control. For it is an old trick on the part of the sons of Loyola, that whenever their order is under threat or suspicion, they swell their numbers by means of the sodalities of new orders. This they did when their order was suppressed. At that time, their numbers swelled by the formation of new orders like St. Vincent de Paul, Brothers of the Christian Doctrine, and other societies by which, according to Wiley, they became even greater in number, perhaps, than they ever were at any former 
period. Now, I'm not going to comment on this fact because we are going later in this book into the time of the oppression of the Jesuits, the time of the founding of the Illuminati and uh, Freemasonry, and we will see a lot of that in the future reading of this book, so I don't comment here on that. But <clears throat> when they quote-unquote were abolished in 1773 by the Antichrist, that they grew in numbers as they came back as the Illuminati is to me quite certain, because a few years after their reinstall reinstallation in 1814, you had this discussion between the two American presidents, when the one said they come here over in swarms and in disguises as only the king of the gypsies can do. So they must have been great in numbers, and that was just a few years after their readmission. Mm. So don't tell me that they were uh, quote unquote extinct. Yeah. Whatever that true number, and I tell you, I don't care. Every Jesuit is one too much, yeah. or one too many. Right. Whatever that true number, there cannot be just 33,000, never mind 3,635 Jesuits in existence today. But we should not be surprised at such deception, for the Jesuit oath says, you have been taught to act the dissembler among the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Protestants generally to be a Protestant and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and even to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. The Jesuits even have their crypto-Jesuits, or Jesuit in short quotes who have been enlisted from all classes of the population. Men, who although not quite entitled to the name Jesuit proper, are as thick with the Jesuits as the berries on a mulberry bush, and being undercover, so to speak, and pretending to have nothing to do with the Jesuits, are better able to render secret service to the order than any of the society's avowed members. Men like Malcolm Muggeridge, William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, and even women like Mother Teresa, who began her work in a Jesuit sodality. There are Jesuits hidden among the elite of the world's most powerful organizations, like the Round Table, the Bilderbergs, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Jesuit Brotherhood are engaged in ministries in over 100 nations on six continents, often in habito secolare, civilian dress. They are now actively involved in human rights and social justice. The end justifies the means, after all. This latter work, human rights, gives them credibility in the eyes of the world and for some historians a man's for their past machinations and atrocities. We shall learn more of some of these uh, atrocities in the coming chapters, when I hasten to assure you is no malicious hype or propaganda, but truth in verity, presented for one reason and one reason only, in the hope that men and women everywhere will be aroused to the impending danger. For as the Jesuit Edmond Campion said, quote, The expense is reckoned, the enterprise is begun, it is of God, it cannot be withstood. Unquote. I will, in the next two chapters, present a few leading examples of the guises of the various associations that are today under the direct control of the great secret society, the modern day genii the sons of the Society of Loyola, Hick et Ubique, here, there, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Continuing in chapter 22, the sons of Loyola, their subtlety, genius, and various disguises. Ours is an age of appearances, and one goes a masquerading all the year. 
from Alessandro Guarini. Don't forget the uh, famous quote from Shakespeare, all the world is a stage. Mm. Ours is an age of appearances and one goes masquerading all the year. What is this? What are people doing when they are in a theater? They masquerade themselves as something that they are not mm -hmm. and they are playing different appearances. Ours is an age of appearances and one goes and masquerading all the year. I was reading this morning, Jörg, in, uh, I believe it was uh, Colossians, about um, Colossians chapter 2, uh, vain deceit, philosophy mm -hmm. and vain deceit. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is vain deceit right here. Absolutely right. That describes the Jesuits to the point, Brett. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. The Jesuit always accomplishes his purpose, for this creature can metamorphose himself into any form. Trained to develop his powers of adaptation to suit the preferences of those whom he wishes to influence or whose confidence he desires to possess, the Jesuit will, with the pain, Pagans be a pagan. With the atheists, he will be an atheist or a liberal. With the Jews, he will be a Jew. And with the reformers, he will be a reformer, even an evangelical. In whatever place or vocation he be found, the Jesuit is always a double man with two distinct missions. One public and the other secret. This license to dissemble was granted to the members of the Society of Jesus by the bull of Antichrist Paul III, which gave every Jesuit a dispensational carte blanche to, quote, lay aside all professions of regard to the papal cause and make outward profession to any religion or government they choose, if by so doing they can better do their utmost to ex to pay the heretical Protestant doctrine. Unquote. Further, there are men who, although not members of the order directly, are what we might call crypto Jesuits. You know, this is a very modern word, Brett. Yeah. People just people just like this crypto Jews, crypto this, crypto that, and most of all crypto Jews and crypto Jesuits. Yeah. But the problem is that most of the time when they use this word, they have no idea what they are talking about. Now, maybe we learn now what a crypto Jesuit really is. Because it says here, mm -hmm. further, there are men who, although not members of the order itself, are what we might call crypto Jesuits, not entitled to the name Jesuit proper, but yet pledged to the aims of the society. Now, what does that mean, pledged? Doesn't that mean that he has sworn? Yes, oath. Doesn't, Take doesn't that oath. mean that he has taken an oath? Yeah, yeah, I would think so. So he, he may be not be a member of the order officially, but he has already transgressed the law of God. Taken a vow, yeah. Yeah, because in Matthew and I think in another part, even a li little later in the Bible, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it says that we should not swear. That's right. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay and everything mm -hmm. else is of the devil, the Bible sh sh says. So even when I'm not a member of the Society of Jesus, but I pledge my word to the aims of the society, I'm already an apostate. Yes, that's right. As one former pupil of the Jesuits, that their chief, uh, as one former pupil of the Jesuits, that their chief objective, quote, is to acquire the highest office of state for the men they have poisoned with their maxims. Okay, there's a word again missing. That's why the sentence didn't make any sense. It must read, as one former pupil of the Jesuit states that the chief objective, quote, is to acquire the highest office of state for the men they have poisoned with their maxims. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are letters and sometimes there are even words missing in that book. I'm sorry, when I read this for the first time, even here and there I fall into the trap. But 
I hope I recover and repair my faultly reading directly afterwards as I just did. Today it is virtually impossible to know how many Jesuits are really members of the order. Mackenzie says of the Jesuits, and this is Kenneth R. H. Mackenzie in his book, The Royal Masonic Cyclopedia. Quote, the order has secret signs and passwords according to the degrees to which the members belong, and as they wear no particular dress, it is very difficult to recognize them unless they reveal themselves as members of the order, for they may appear as Protestants or Catholics, Democrats or aristocrats, infidels or bigots, according to the special mission with which they are entrusted. And it is a well-known fact that members of the order of high family and delicate uh, nurture are acting as menial servants in Protestant families and doing other things of a similar nature in aid of the society's purposes. Unquote. Now, listen, we know, at least since we have started reading this book, if not before, that the Compagnie de Jesus, the Company of Jesus, the Society of Jesus, is a military order. It was founded with the bull of the Pope, uh, of, of Pope uh, Paul III, Regimini Militantis Ecclesia, the Church at War. It's a militant organization. Now, when you join the military over there in the United States of America, over here in Europe, in any country, in any country where you are, and you, you join the military of your country, the first thing you are given is what? A weapon. A uniform. Oh, you <laughs> uniform. Yeah, right. You get a uniform. Uniform and you all dress alike so you recognize each other. Yes. When then you go to the battlefield, you have to shoot at the guy that wears another uniform, not the same that you are wearing, because then you would shoot someone of your own own your men. That's right. And therefore, people are wearing uniforms to distinguish one from each other. What do the Jesuits do? They wear the uniform on the inside. You can see them on the outside. They are not all dressed in Jesuit priest robes, they are not all dressed in this kind of clothing or that kind of clothing. It could be the beggar on the street and you have no idea that he is maybe a Jesuit. Yeah, the street preacher. That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. They can wear whatever they want. They yeah. have no uniformity. And that's the difference with all other military orders because normally in the military, well, they all wear more or less the same uniform. I mean, I was in the Navy and I had another uniform than, of course, the um, uh, the infantry had uh, or, or the Air Force had. But I knew the un these uniforms. I would have never shot a German fella in a, in a German uniform, not only recognizable by the flag, but also from the uniform itself. Mm -hmm. So right. you make sure that you know yours and you know that everyone else who wears another uniform or anything else, you can just shut his head off mm -hmm. when you are at war, of course. If you're not right. at war, I wouldn't do that. Then it's cold-blooded murder. But even in war, it's cold-blooded murder, according to the Bible. I don't care about that. But, but I just want to make the point for right. all the secular guys out there. Yes. A military has a uniform so that it is recognizable and that you know who is on your side. The Jesuits wear their uniform on the inside you have no idea nor by their profession nor by their clothes whether they are a member of the society of jesus or not do you want to make a comment there brad oh yeah well you know it just um it just seems um i need to drink some more coffee and my stomach is just kind of yeah i'm a little woozy this morning yerk Oh, that's okay. I, I just thought that you wanted to say something there, so if not, then I'm just going to continue. No problem. Please, yeah. Please just go right not only do the Jesuits have their own secret passwords or code words, but they are prepared and taught to assume any guise and act on any side of any issue. If in the end it will be for the Catholic Church's advantage. They are all spies. Every one of them all spies do you doubt this dear reader doubt it not be assured of it it is part of their catechism did we not read earlier what is told to the jesuit in his initiation quote 
You have been taught to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, that only the church might be the gainer in the end. What is the most famous example I could quote here for what I just read to you? Hitler as the leader of the Third Reich and Stalin as the leader of the Soviet Union. Both at least Stalin was a Jesuit trained, was a Jesuit, and Hitler was Jesuit controlled. To take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected. Well, did Hitler and Stalin go to war? Yes. Did they kill a lot of their own people? Hitler of the Germans and Stalin of the Soviets? Yes. And who was the gainer in the end? Right, the church. According to the Jesuits, all such duplicity, deception and dissembling is not only permissible, it is not only permissible, but also justifiable. Ad majorum di gloriam, for the greater glory of God, for the end always justifies the means. They are masters of disguise. And the following account will, I hope, assist the listener and viewer of this video and reader to see how this is possible. In 1574, a man appeared in Stockholm, Sweden having been invited by King John III, who reigned between 1568 and 1592. He was introduced as a visiting Lutheran scholar, Professor Lauritz Nielsen. His lectures were so eloquent and powerful that the halls were filled whenever he spoke around Stockholm. Even the king himself regularly attended Nielsen's lectures. Jesuit author Manfred Bartel Take up the account from here, and now quote. The seminarians mean the Protestants who attended his lectures because, you know, all of Scandinavia, Sweden and uh, Norway at that time, I, didn't, I don't know that Finland existed already. Anyway, all these countries were Protestant. So the seminarians means the Protestant who attended his lectures were struck by the judicious even-handedness of Professor Nielsen's approach. He was careful to present arguments on both sides of every question, and as the seminars drew on, the possible objections he offered to Luther's teaching began to proliferate alarmingly. The king himself was finally compelled to intercede in Luther's behalf. But King John, strictly an amateur theologian, was no match for the professor and was forced to concede defeat. The audience only later realized that Nielsen had not only stood Luther on his head, but had done so by citing the doctrines of the Church of Rome. What was not made clear, at least for some time, was that this was strictly a pull-up job and that the professor was actually a Catholic himself and a Jesuit to boot. After Father Nielsen had successfully sowed doubt and confusion among the Lutheran clergy, he was recalled to Rome. Unquote. Professor Nielsen, or quote unquote Father Nielsen, because he was a member of the Society of Jesus, was not an exception. He was the classic prototype of a Jesuit for whom the end always justifies the means. In the 1700s saw another Jesuit deceiver, Lacunza, interesting, which is now coming, I know this. Lacunza, who was born in Th South America in 1731. He wrote under the Jewish name Ben Ezra, Rabbi Ben Ezra, 
even addressing the Jews as brethren in his preface, he entitled his book The Coming of Messiah and Glory and Majesty. It taught futurism based on the teaching of Jesuit Francisco Ribera from 1590 mm -hmm. and was one of the first to falsely interpret the woman of Revelation 12 as a future apostate church. The book received wide circulation and was instrumental in turning the Protestant world to a Catholic futurist interpretation concerning the Antichrist. That foundation that had been laid by Francisco Ribera in 1590 fell on fruitful ground with Ben Ezra, also known as Lacunza, with his book, The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty. And this book was then promoted all through the Catholic world in that time. And since then, futurism has become rampant, has gone rampant in the world. So rampant that today in 2018, almost nobody who even calls himself a Protestant protests anymore and has any idea what he protests and does not identify the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist anymore. And it all goes hand in hand with the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden of an unfulfilled 70th week of Daniel, of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, which our Lord Jesus Christ completely and perfectly fulfilled almost 2,000 years ago, when he became the perfect lamb of the Passover and spilled his blood for our redemption of sins, because he himself was sinless. That's the only way how he could take all our sins on him. And that's why through him we are made righteous. No other way. Mm -hmm. And futurism tells that Daniel's 70th week is not yet fulfilled. They pull a gap out of their ass. Oh, I don't know where they got it, but it's mm -hmm. not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, it is very clear. You have 70 weeks, uh, seven weeks, then you have 62 weeks, and then you have the last week. It says, in the, uh, in the midst of the week, it says in Daniel 9, uh, verse 26, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to take this right here on my online Bible. Just give me a second, then I can quote it word for word. Mm -hmm. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So, after three score and two weeks, and we have had before that seven weeks, that's 69 weeks. Then he shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and until the end of the world desolations are determined. Now, I'm not going into complete Daniel 9. I have done that in earlier videos, and you can watch a lot of uploads with Tom Fress and all that stuff where we go into that. I just want to mention this because we are speaking here about futurism. We are speaking here about the Rabbi Ben Ezra of the uh, Jesuit deceiver Lacunza and his book, um, The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty, which builds on this future lie and of course also with the rapture lie it's the same thing okay the historian Newman gives this eloquent assessment quote the Jesuit missionary or worker in any sphere may adapt his dress manner of life and occupation to the exigence uh, to the exigencies of the occasion he may disguise himself and figure as a Protestant or a, Brahim, or a Brahmin, if by so doing he can gain an entrance otherwise difficult for Catholic teaching. The story is familiar of a Jesuit who mastered the Sanskrit language and the Vedas, assumed the dress and mode of life of a Brahmin priest, and finally wrote and palmed off as ancient a Vida in which Roman Catholic Christianity, under a thin disguise, was taught. Former Catholic priest Descantis, who was also a professor of theology in Rome and the official theological censor of the Office of Inquisition, 
had this to say about the clandestine operations of the Jesuits, or clandestine operations of the Jesuits. His disclosure gives us an indication of the near impossibility of knowing the number of Jesuits in service at any given time. Quote, Despite all the persecution they have met with, they have not abandoned England, where there are a greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. There are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant priest or how a Protestant priest could be a Jesuit. But my confessor silenced my scruples by telling me Omnia Munda Mundis and what St. Paul became and that St. Paul became a Jew that he might save the Jews it was no wonder therefore if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of the Protestants but pay attention I entreat you to discover the religious movement in England termed Puyism. The English clergy were formerly too much attached to their articles of faith to be shaken from them. And so the Jesuits of England tried another plan. This was to demonstrate from history and ecclesiastical antiquity, ancient documents prove this, whence through the exertion of the Jesuits concealed a among its clergy, might, uh, might arise a studious attention to Christian antiquity. This was designed to occupy the clergy in long, laborious and abstruse investigation and to alienate them from their Bibles. Puism is a living testimony to the necessity of Catholicism in the midst of our enemies. It is a war at the root, which, skillfully nourished by our extortions, will waste Protestantism till it is destroyed. Unquote. Professor Descantes goes on to say that the Jesuits are, quote, concealed among the English clergy and even in Parliament, unquote. Consider a key figure of the English Parliament, Tony Blair. Stephen Knight, the deceased author of The Brotherhood, has said that the Palace of Westminster home of the British Parliament is used as meeting place for the new Welcome Masonic Lodge. The adorable Tony Blair is a high-ranking Freemason and a member of the 1591 Stand Home Lodge. He is also a secret Romanist, a Jesuit in short robe, and I believe he was a secret Catholic even before his election as Prime Minister. Don't forget the short robes are what we called earlier in this book the coadjutors. Mm -hmm. huh? That's right. An article, an article by Steve Pierce entitled My Peace I Give You and published in the January 1998 edition of Workers of Iniquity alleges that it is the Roman Catholic Church that is behind Tony Blair and his new labor. The Times of April 17, 2003, reported in a front-page headline, quote, Blair admits he is strongly drawn to Catholicism. And Alessandro Zangrando reported in his Roman landscape column of the Latin Mass magazine, quote, British Prime Minister Tony Blair seems intent on embracing the Catholic faith. Blair, a guest last August in the villa of Prince Giardini Strozzi, asked and obtained permission to assist at a private Catholic Mass the day of Ferragosto, the Feast of the Assumption. That's 15th of August. There was no attempt to be discreet because he attended in the parish church of Cusona. The masses were celebrated by Father Ian Wilson and Father Brian Lovery. Bishop Mauro Fusi of Italy was also present 
and Tony Blair read the first scripture reading and the prayer of the faithful. Moreover, he got in line and received Holy Communion. What does that mean, that he received Holy Communion? That means that he took the Eucharist. Yep. That means that he believes and practices the superstitious religion of transubstantiation. When our Lord Jesus Christ is by the words hook as hoc est corpus in meum, transferred from heaven into a piece of bread, and the whole body, soul, blood, flesh, divinity, and humanity of Jesus Christ is to be found in that piece of bread that is then to be eaten. That was first done by the priests of Baal, Cana Baal. That's where cannibalism comes from. Jesus Christ is sacrificed over and over and over again in the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church does not accept that Jesus Christ on the cross said, it is finished. It was done once and for all. No more sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice in the completion of Daniel's 70th week of Daniel chapter 9. Don't believe otherwise. And if you do, study your Bible and write comments and question us about this. We will try to help you if you are open for help. We will always do that. And we'll continue next time in the reading of Cold War. But Babylon, in the middle of page 219, in the chapter The Sons of Loyola, their subtlety, genius, and various disguises. We have three more pages to go through this chapter, and then we will come to chapter 23, which is called Behind a Thousand Masks, Loyola's Offsprings and Their Agents. So you see, it's still going to be very, very interesting to follow these readings. I thank you very much, Brett, for getting up early and coming mm -hmm. to the table that we could do this reading today. I will leave to you the closing remarks of this uh, broadcast because we have almost come to the hour and I think it was strong enough that we should uh, end on a strong note and I mm -hmm. think what I just read is ending on a strong note with the Holy Communion and Daniel's 70th week. So from me, Jörg, I say thanks for watching, listening, commenting. May God bless you and until next time, bye-bye. Thank you, Yerk. That was a wonderful reading you did today. And um, looking forward to the next recording here. And uh, I'll uh, catch up with everyone soon. And, and we will say bye for now. And God bless. Take care. And hope to talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. That for the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst, his bride, the church, 
is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,025 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things, uh, aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history, and I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.